Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, an attorney licensed in both New York and Florida. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're continuing in our series where we rewatch testimony from the three past trials in the murder of Dan Markell. Three trials, one topic, one witness. Today, we are reviewing Wendy Adelson's testimony about her desire to relocate from Tallahassee to South Florida, a main, if not the main reason, behind the events leading to the murder of Dan Markell. And as a special bonus, in this video, after we see her testimony, we're gonna go straight to the source. I've pulled the entire divorce file and will walk you through the relocation requests made by Wendy, the targeted responses from Dan Markell, as well as the court's order on the entire matter. Let's get started. And when you separated initially in the fall of 2012, did you move to South Florida with the kids? No, I did not. You didn't go to South Florida with the kids? No, I did not. Okay. Was it your desire during that time to move with the children to South Florida? I would say right then, no, it wasn't. Was there a time during the time that you were living there at Aqua Ridge? Aqua Ridge, that you determined that you would like to move to South Florida with the children? There was. All right. And were your parents very involved in trying to facilitate that relocation? My parents were supportive of me moving to South Florida. Would you describe your parents as being over-involved in your personal business? As compared to other people's parents? Yeah. I don't know. And you mentioned that you did develop a desire to move to South Florida. Did you file a motion to that effect on January 14th, 2013? That sounds, that sounds, I did file a motion. I don't remember the exact date. Okay. But that sounds about right. All right. And in that motion, did you make some allegations that Mr. Markell was making things difficult for you at work? I did. Okay. And was that motion granted or denied? That motion was denied. All right, denied with prejudice? I don't remember. Okay. If you have it, you can, I'm happy to take a look. Okay, but in any event, you were not able to move at that time. I did not move. Okay. And were you upset about being stuck in Tallahassee? I was relieved. You were relieved, you wanted to stay in Tallahassee. I was happy at my job. And part of what you were seeking in your divorce in these documents in front of you was permission from the court to move with your children to South Florida. Is that correct? That was part of the overall divorce proceedings. All right, and specifically on pages 43 through 50, there's a petition to include a request to be allowed to relocate with minor children. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And why were you seeking to move to South Florida? I was seeking a place that would be stable and permanent for the kids and me. Danny never planned on staying in Tallahassee. It was just a question of time before he moved to New York to be with his girlfriend or had dreams of being at Harvard. So Tallahassee was just a temporary stopping point. I wanted a place that was permanent for us where we had family support. And why did South Florida seem like a place of permanence? To you. Right. I mean, because we had family support, uh, because I work in immigration, there were a lot of uh, career opportunities for me there. Are you from South Florida? I am. Okay. And when you say family support, what family resided there? Uh, my mother, father, and brother. Was the relocation to South Florida the most important part of your divorce? No. Was it your most non-negotiable term? No but it was very important to you? Uh, I wouldn't say it was very important to me. It was, was it very important to your mother? She was much more looking forward to having her daughter and her grandchildren home, yeah. Right. If you would take a look for me at page 46, 
paragraph E. Just read that to yourself and let me know when you've had an opportunity to read that. I read the first paragraph by E. Do you want me to read the second one? Uh, yes, please. Okay. And in those paragraphs, Ms. Adelson, is, are you alleging that Mr. Markell has created a hostile work environment for you at the Florida State University College of Law? He did during a period of time. Right, and was disparaging you to your colleagues. And if you'll take a look at pages beginning on 79, the document beginning on 79. And the question is, is this Mr. Markell's 23-page response to your motion to relocate? You're asking me, is this his, his response to your motion to relocate? Yes, it looks like it. All right. That's quite verbose. Would you agree with that? I imagine it is. At some point, Danny fired or alienated all of his attorneys and started doing his own legal work. So Fair to say he was adamantly opposed to you taking his kids to South Florida. Yes, he shared all of that here, which is different than the conversations we had, but this... That's what he filed. This, what he filed, is what the judge uh, sanctioned him for. All yes. Right. And in that filing, I'm specifically referencing to page 82 where Markel states that the sole stated reason the wife seeks to relocate with the party's minor children is so she can be closer to her parents. My understanding is you, you don't agree that's why you wanted to move. It wasn't the sole reason why I wanted to move. Okay. But you do agree it was a reason. It was absolutely a reason. I wanted to create some stability for my kids and family, having family around helps have a more stable environment. Did your motion for relocation get granted or denied by the court? It was denied by the court. So you were not legally permitted to move to Miami? No. Did you have an alternative? You mentioned previously that there was a hostile work environment at Florida State University as a result of your husband did, or your ex-husband at this point, were you caught, was the failure to be able to relocate, did that cause you to remain in that environment? It did. For how long? Um, I don't remember the date that the petition to relocate was denied. If you could show me the binder, I can I could find the date. And I'll draw you to pages 262 and Okay, so the order was on June. No. What the day was? It was June twentieth, twenty thirteen. So I was still working at the law school through July twenty fourteen. So I stayed for one more year. Okay, and. It was subsequent to his death that you were able to find new employment that was in a less hostile work environment. Is that accurate? I mean, eventually after his death, I found new employment. It took me a little while. Okay. How long did you stay in Tallahassee after your husband was killed? I husband, sorry. stayed a couple of days. Okay, and that's the filing in reference to your motion for relocation? Yes. Okay, and did you file this motion with the intent to not be successful? 
Sorry, I don't it's understand been suggested the question. That you never thought that was going to be successful, did you? I think not? there. I thought there was a small chance that it would be successful, but not very likely. No. Okay. And weren't you thinking, well, maybe Danny would be happy working somewhere else because he's mentioned applying elsewhere, so maybe he'll allow the relocation? Were you well, thinking that? Well, he and I talked about the relocation. So when we talked about it, he thought, well, if I can live nearby in Miami, that might work, and then I could commute mm -hmm. to FSU. I didn't mean for him to leave FSU, but he wanted to leave FSU at some point. So that so was just a matter of time. So you thought it might be successful? Sure. I mean, I thought it was possible, but not likely. All right. And page 46 of that document, paragraph E references the job offer. The wife also desires to relocate to South Florida in order to provide a better quality of life for the children by increasing their access to close family and providing more stability and consistency. Who is the close family in South Florida? The close family would have been my mom and my dad and my brother. And which brother is that? My brother that's here today. Charlie Adelson? That's correct. Okay. And in this filing, doesn't Mr. Markell say, quote, the husband affirmatively alleges that the wife helped herself to non-marital assets, including money and stocks owned prior to marriage, as well as numerous personal non-marital belongings of the husband, such as luggage, bicycle, tennis racket and family heirlooms. The wife has refused to return these items or to allow the husband into her home to see what other personal belongings were taken without his permission or acquiescence. So my point is, he's accusing you of theft in this paragraph. Those are the words that are here, yes. Yeah, and, and he's very adamantly objecting to your relocation, right? I, on page 82, it says the sole stated reason the wife seeks to relocate is so that she can be closer to her parents. Was being near your parents the sole reason that you wanted to relocate? No. It wasn't the sole reason stated in your petition? It wasn't the sole reason stated in my petition, and it wasn't the sole reason that he and I talked about before I filed the motion to relocate. Why was he so adamant and so confident that this was the real reason you wanted to be down there? I think there's a lot of things in these pleadings that are not true. So just because it says something doesn't make it true. Sure. But did he know that your mom was just grinding on this issue of trying to get you down there? He would have had no that, idea. He wouldn't have been, that wouldn't have been known to him? I don't think so. Hmm. But he was accusing you in these pleadings of all kind of stuff, right? I mean, I'm not saying it's too, but hiding financial assets, failing to disclose things, kidnapping his kids in the middle of, you know, his business trip, all those sorts of things, right? Yes, he said lots of things. All right. And you said a lot of things, too. There's filings going both ways that are pretty venomous. Would you agree with that? I would not agree with that. Yours were pleasant. I'm not saying divorce filings are pleasant, but mine were not venomous. Okay. Did your mother, Donna Adelson, re review the uh, filing in which Dan Markella is accusing you of this theft and all this stuff? I don't remember if she did. Okay. Did you view yourself as being stuck here in Tallahassee once the relocation was denied? I didn't. I mean, I had a really nice life here. I did not view myself as being <laughs> stuck. Would you please turn to page 176 in that exhibit in front of you? I think it's highlighted for you. Did you describe yourself in that filing as being stuck in Tallahassee? I don't see it. You said it was highlighted, but there's nothing highlighted. Okay. 176. Mm -hmm. I didn't highlight it for you. Okay. Just a moment. I see the word stuck. I, I found it. Okay. 
So did you describe at least in one occasion being stuck in Tallahassee? No. Can I read the sentence? Sure. sure. So it says, the husband has made it difficult for the wife with her colleagues at her current position due to his statements and actions. And the husband's intent is to relocate to a larger area at some point. So the wife is merely stuck in Tallahassee until the husband decides that the time is right for him to leave. Right. Meaning and did, had he accepted a job anywhere else by the time that he was murdered? No, he hadn't yet been offered a job, but he was always looking. Okay. So he was just going to move and just let you have the kids at that point? He probably would have done what I did, which is have a conversation and see if it was a place that made sense for both of us to live. And would you have moved to wherever he got a great job and started a new life there? Potentially, yeah. Okay. Did you like Tallahassee? I did. And you said, I think you did say this, but let me clarify. Was your mom aware of the order denying relocation? My mom was aware of the order denying relocation. And what about your brother, Charlie? Was he aware of that as well? I'm sure you know? my mom would have said something to him. All right. So did your mom suggest any ways that you might coerce Dan Mar Markel to let you um, move? With and you were lobbying for human anti-human trafficking legislation? I was primarily representing victims of human trafficking, um, but I did a little bit of lobbying too. But the funding for your job ran out and you lost your job, right? Yeah. At the time of the divorce, you had gotten a job at FSU. What was that job? At the time of the divorce, I was adjunct teaching a few classes at the law school. And I was probably, I had a number of different jobs at FSU. But by that point, I was probably running something called a medical legal partnership, where I would work with the law school, the medical school, and the social social work school to help the students work together to try to um, help solve legal problems that that clients had. Did you like that job? I did. Yeah. So if you liked the job so much, why were you looking to relocate? I mean, relocation was not a big issue for me. I probably never would have thought of it a friend suggested it to me that it might be helpful. Maybe I would get more time with the kids if I if I could relocate. Um, but I wasn't really focused on it. I didn't think it would happen. And I was pretty happy being at my job. Now, you were a non-tenured clinical professor in that job, right? That's right. It meant that you could lose the job at any time. Is that fair sure. to say? Mm -hmm. And you were... Uh, had a lot of responsibilities now being divorced, even more responsibilities with the kids. Sure. And you were offered uh, a job at a prestigious law firm in Miami. Is that fair to say? I was, yes. And uh, that job was going to have a pretty big salary increase. Yes. And it was going to give you an opportunity for more stability. Fair enough? Yeah. You were also going to have the benefit of family sure. in South Florida who could help you with the kids, right? Yeah. Now, even with this relocation request, was it ever your intention for Professor Markell to be absent from your boy's life? Never, no. Okay. When you lost the relocation motion, I think it's fair to say that your mom and dad were pretty upset. That's right. Uh, it's fair to say that your mom came up with some crazy ideas. Totally bonkers. Yes. Okay. Did you ben benefit from Professor Markell's death? No. Well, you got to live in South Florida. It's not a benefit. I got a hold of Dan and Wendy's divorce court file and suffice it to say, it was venomous and also a complete rabbit hole. In fact, an entire series could just be done going over these filings. 
but we're focused here today on the motion for relocation. Buckle up because this will be a long one, but it's an important one because in reviewing the filings, we really get a feel for where they both were at mentally and emotionally back in 2013. The vitriol and animosity is dripping from those pages. Wendy filed the divorce paperwork on September 10th, 2012. On January 14th, 2013, she filed a motion for temporary relocation with the kids, requesting that she be allowed to move to Coral Springs, Florida, because she'd been offered a job in the area for $30,000 more than what she was making at the time in Tallahassee. That job was to begin on May 1st, 2013. So she requested an expedited hearing on her motion because she needed to let the employer know if she could accept the job or not. Now, because she didn't originally request relocation in her divorce petition, she filed an amended divorce petition with the relocation request at the same time she filed the motion for relocation. Let's go over in a little bit more detail what Wendy had to say in support of her request for relocation. Her motion for temporary relocation was actually very short and it only identified the job offer as the only reason for her request. Where she went into a lot more detail was in the amended petition. So let's look at that document. Okay, so this is the amended petition for uh, dissolution of marriage and request to be allowed to relocate with the minor children. It's the same document that was originally filed by Wendy, except this one, it was amended to include the request to relocate with the minor children. So let's go directly down to that section where that request is being made. Okay, so it gives her proposed address, uh, mailing address, physical address, phone number, and then it states the date of the intended move or proposed re relocation is as soon as possible because the wife has been offered a job in Boca Raton, Florida beginning May 1st, 2013. The specific reason for the proposed relocation is that the wife has been offered a job in Boca Raton, Florida, paying her substantially more in salary and year in bonus than her current job as a clinical professor. The job offer for the position of an attorney with Grossman Roth, PA, is reduced to writing and is attached here too. The wife also desires to relocate to South Florida in order to better provide a better in order to provide a better quality of life for the children by increasing their access to close family and providing more stability and consistency. First, neither the wife nor the husband, who is a Canadian citizen, has any family in Tallahassee. By contrast, the wife's parents reside in Coral Springs and the wife's brother resides 20 minutes away. That's Charlie. The children are very close to the wife's parents as they have visited three to four weeks since every three to four weeks since the birth of the children. Furthermore, the husband travels a great deal, approximately 45 to 55 days away from the family each year. Second, the husband and wife both work for the Florida State University School of Law. The husband is a tenured professor, while the wife's position is on a non-tenure track and a more tenuous one. The husband has indicated to the wife that her employment at FSU Law School is solely dependent upon his discretion. The husband also has also created a hostile work environment for the wife at FSU School of Law by telling the administration and their joint colleagues that the wife has stolen from him and that she has mental health issues isolating the wife in Tallahassee's small legal community and further limiting the wife's career prospects in the area. The husband has been constantly dropping into wife's office unannounced, uninvited, and undesired. The husband continued to do so until asked to stop by legal counsel. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Better? Okay, yeah. Finally, since arriving in Tallahassee in 2005, the husband has indicated his intention to seek employment at another law school outside of Tallahassee. He has consistently through the year sent out resumes and has at one point even accepted a position at another school, which then fell through. That was UM. With no roots to bind either party to Tallahassee other than the husband's position as a law professor, the wife believes that the party's time in Tallahassee is tenuous. These facts demonstrate an unstable environment that does not serve the best interests of the children post-dissolution of marriage. The wife seeks more consistency and stable employment to improve 
the quality of life for herself and her children. The wife proposes that the party's timeshare be on a 60-40 basis, as the husband has access to his great uncle's two-bedroom apartment in Hallandale, Florida, and his aunt and uncle three aunt and uncle's three-bedroom apartment in Pembroke Pines, Florida. The husband has a very flexible schedule so that he can come to see the children as often as he would like for extended periods of time. The husband only has teaching responsibility two days per week during the fall and spring semesters and does not teach during the summer semester. The wife proposes that during the school year, the husband comes to South Florida every other Saturday through Tuesday and in the off week come for at least two days to see the children. The wife also suggests alternating the major holidays and extended time for the husband with the children in the summer. The wife proposes that for these extended times, the children travel to Tallahassee or wherever the husband is living. The cost of transportation should be shared if it is not otherwise paid for by the husband's employment. Next in the petition, uh, Wendy goes through the different um the different criteria that Florida courts have to go through in making a determination for relocation when there are minor children involved. Um, so we'll go through this really quickly. The court should consider the following in making its determination. One, the, qual the nature, quality, extent of involvement and duration of the child's relationship with the parent or other person proposing to relocate with the child and with the non-relocating parent, other persons, siblings, half-siblings, and other significant persons in the child's life. The wife has extended family and friends in the South Florida area, and the husband has no family in the Tallahassee area. The minor children have no other siblings. The children are both to close parents. Two, the age and developmental stage of the child, the needs of the child, and the likely impact the relocation will have on the child's physical, educational, and emotional development, taking into consideration any special needs of the child. The relocation will not materially impact the children because they are not yet school age. They will be allowed to emotionally develop well and will have more support from extended family relationships. Three, the feasibility of preserving the relationship between the non-relocating parent or other person and the child through substitute arrangements that take into consideration the logistics of contact, access, and time sharing, as well as the financial circumstances of the parties, whether those factors are sufficient to foster a continuing meaningful relationship between the child and the non-relocating parent or other person, and the likelihood of compliance with the substitute arrangements by the relocating parent or other person once he or she is out of the jurisdiction of the court. The wife will comply with all substitute arrangements and the parenting time for the husband should be as extensive as his employment and health will allow. The husband suffers from Crohn's disease, persistent episodes of vertigo, and back problems that resulted in surgery in December 2012. When any combination of these issues arises, he is unable to care for the children on his own. Four, the children, the child's preference, taking into consideration the age and maturity of the child. The child is too young. The children are too young to voice any preference here. Five, whether the relocation will enhance the general quality of life for both the parent or other person seeking the relocation and the child, including but not limited to financial or emotional benefits or educational opportunities. The quality of life for both the wife and the children will improve greatly because the wife will have a better more consistent job, the help of extended family, and the children will have increased access to extended family as well. Six, the reasons each parent or other person is seeking or opposing the relocation. The wife is seeking to relocate for a better, more stable job and to have the children grow up in a stable and consistent environment and not repeatedly relocate across the country as the husband moves for ever better positions. The current employment and economic circumstances of each parent or other person and whether the proposed relocation is necessary to improve the economic circumstances of the parent or other person seeking relocation of the child. The wife's employment is going to be considerably better with this move. The husband has no intention of staying in Tallahassee and has consistently expressed his intent to move to a much larger city and more prestigious school. The husband has considered Miami, Houston, New York, Washington, D.C., and St. Louis among his choices. Eight, that the relocation is sought in good faith 
and the extent to which the objecting parent has fulfilled his or her financial obligations to the parent or other person seeking relocation, including child support, spousal support, and marital property and marital debt obligations. The wife is seeking this relocation in good faith. Nine, the career and other opportunities available to the objecting parent or other person if the relocation occurs. The career opportunities for the husband are the same regardless of the wife's relocation and will create a situation where the transportation is even better for the husband when he moves to a larger metropolitan area. 10. A history of substance or substance abuse or domestic violence as defined in the Florida statutes, which meets, which meets the criteria of another Florida statute by either parent, including a consideration of the severity of such con conduct and the failure or success of any attempts at rehabilitation. This is not applicable. Wife has retained Kristen Ad Adamson to represent her in this cause and has agreed and has agreed agrees to pay her a reasonable fee for her services plus suit money and costs based on the relative financial circumstances of the parties husband should be required to pay or contribute to wife's attorney's fees suit money and costs both temporary and final so that is the end of the petition to relocate in the um, proposed amended petition for dissolution so her final request uh, for Dan to pay her legal fees related to the divorce and the relocation petition, I mean, she didn't give any reason for why he should have to pay her bills, only based on the relative financial circumstances of both parties. I frankly can see this as just legal maneuvering and posturing. Sometimes you just throw in some type of relief because, hey, you never know. If you don't ask, you never know. So although it appears to be overreaching, I don't necessarily hold this ask against Wendy. So let's see what Dan had to say in response to Wendy's request for relocation. It's a lot. And a lot of it is repetitive, but I want to give Dan a voice here. So I'll summarize some things, but read verbatim other points of his. He hits on literally every single point and more that was raised in Wendy's petition. Dan's first argument is that Wendy's only reason for wanting to relocate is so she can be closer to her parents. He puts in a footnote that in a January 2013 electronic communication to husband, wife claimed that she thought relocation was, quote, in the best interest of our kids to be closer to family, more access to a Jewish community and a happier mom, close quote. She doesn't mention the economic rationale at all, which lies at the heart of her filed petition. And her written petition doesn't mention the Jewish community at all, because the facts are the wife has done nothing to facilitate the children's connection to the Jewish community since the separation. She not only introduced them to a non-kosher diet since the separation, but on her weekends, she refuses to allow husband to continue their pre-separation practice of bringing the children every week to synagogue for services and Sunday school, notwithstanding that husband has offered wife time-sharing offsets in exchange for allowing that to happen. Accordingly, the only reasons for the relocation are, quote, happier mom and more access to wife's parents. Dan then went on to explain their current living situation in terms of proximity of the homes to the children's preschool and to the FSU campus where both of them were employed. He explained in another footnote the details of how he learned Wendy was divorcing him as follows. On September 10th, 2012, after two days of not answering husband's calls or texts, Wife urgently called husband while he was on a short business trip in New York City and told him for the first time and over the phone that she wanted a divorce, notwithstanding the absence of any infidelity, abuse, or neglect by either party. He begged for her not to do anything until he returned and that he would be on the next flight home. Arriving at home that night, he was shocked. Wife was gone. The boys were gone. The house was half plundered. The Schwab accounts had been raided and divorce papers were left on the bed. Most importantly, there were no indication of, there was no indication of where the wife and children were. 
worse for the first 15 days of separation, wife refused to give husband any address or phone number for where she lived with the children. Thus, when the children were not with the husband or at the preschool, the husband had no idea where his children were. On September 25th, 2012, wife finally answered husband's and his counsel's plea for a proper address, but she gave him a false address that wasn't corrected until four weeks later. Dan details the daily extent to which he was a part of his children's lives prior to the party separation in 2012. Since the separation, he says that they've had equal time sharing and that he's even gone over and above to allow Wendy greater access to the kids than she gives to him by offering Skype calls or in-person visits on days he has the kids. He said that those considerations were not afforded to him and that Wendy, quote, largely ignores the children on days and evenings that she does not have responsibility for them, close quote. Next, Dan proceeded to tear apart Wendy's proffered re reason for relocation, the job offer. He wrote that Wendy earned at least $100,000 a year in a new position that she accepted at FSU, and that once cost of living adjustments were made, the proposed employment in South Florida would be equivalent to her current pay in Tallahassee, and possibly even less when benefits were figured into the equation. He added that the new job would require her to commute for more than an hour a day and work substantially longer hours than she did at, F at her FSU job. He said that her current position at FSU offered an equivalent of tenure, such that it's just like long-term job security, which she would not have in private practice. Apparently, her job at FSU only required Wendy to teach students 34 weeks a year and be at the school for six hours a week. The very fact that the wife is seeking to change her current employment and relocate reveals an inability to prioritize the children's well-being, since her proposed employment would not only drastically impede and reduce the husband's access to and involvement with the children, but would also substantially reduce her own ability to spend time with the children. At the same time, she would dramatically reduce her own job stability, flexibility, and quality of life. Her proposed new job provides no gain of any significance to the children's best interests. More basically, the economic rationale for the wife's petition is made in bad faith. The wife claims that the job in South Florida at the Grossman Roth firm will pay her more and that's why she wants to relocate. Nowhere in her petition does she even allege that she is A, inadequately compensated in Tallahassee, to maintain a good quality of life for the children, or more importantly, B, that she has made any effort to find a higher paying job in Tallahassee. Her utter failure to show any efforts to find a higher paying job in Tallahassee reveals that she is not at all interested in relocating for financial purposes, but rather that she simply wants to leave Tallahassee after living here since 2005 so she can move on with her life near her parents. Dan next addressed Wendy's claim that moving to South Florida would provide more stability and consistency for the kids. The only inconsistency and instability in their life has been introduced by the wife's abandonment of the husband and her move to a new and unfamiliar home in the last few months. He argued that moving to South Florida would worsen the inconsistency and instability because they'd be moving between six homes in a very short amount of time. The six homes being the two Tallahassee houses, his and Wendy's, Wendy's temporary home with her parents in Coral Springs, then a permanent place for Wendy once she gets more settled, as well as a short-term home, short home for Dan in South Florida until he can secure a permanent home there. He then challenged Wendy's assertion that he planned on leaving Tallahassee and was looking for a new job elsewhere. He said that prior to the separation, he considered opportunities in other cities, but he received a promotion and additional job security in the form of a chaired tenureship at FSU beginning in August 2013. So 
he no longer had any desire or intention for relocation for any other position. With regard to Wendy's allegation that Dan created a hostile work environment at FSU for her that was causing her work to be in jeopardy, Dan discredits it and informed the court that Wendy was offered and accepted a raise and a full-time position since the separation. The last main point Dan made addressed the argument that relocating would provide better access to Wendy's family in South Florida. He pointed out that not only is a, not only is that a legally inadequate justification for relocation, but doing so, quote, would only devastate the husband's parenting role, shrink the family's assets, and substantially impede the wife's own parenting opportunities, close quote. He lamented that under Wendy's proposed relocation plan, Dan would have to travel 480 miles for timesharing and be unavailable on the other days and completely miss day-to-day -day interactions, special events, or emergencies. And as far as his housing in South Florida, he said no, he could not, he and the kids could not stay in his aunt and uncle's retirement community condominium or his 95-year-old uncle's one-bedroom apartment. Next, he addressed each of the statutory factors that have to be considered by courts in making a relocation determination when there are minor children involved. He mostly made the same arguments that he raised earlier, but there are some snippets that I'd like to highlight for you. Indeed, because the husband still wants the children to maintain a close relationship with the wife, the husband currently does not seek more or less than 50% of time sharing, assuming there is no relocation. If the wife decided to relocate without the children, he would find it regrettable, but would then seek to be the primary residential parent. Under the party's current rotating time-sharing arrangement, the husband cares for the children on half the nights and virtually all of the weekends that he can and visits them at Creative Preschool, where he spends time with the children on a daily basis. In short, he sees them 12 out of 14 days and has endeavored to reach agreement with the wife to facilitate more access and overnights for both parents. Since the party separation, the husband has worked exceedingly hard to communicate with the wife regarding their time-sharing schedule. And though the parties have exercised equal time-sharing since their separation, it has been difficult to maintain this arrangement with the wife. The wife's penchant for deception or lack of transparency has manifested itself in various ways that are relevant to determining that she cannot be trusted to keep her commitments with regard to parental time sharing. For example, despite the party's agreement to saying the wife has on various occasions failed to allow the children to Skype with the husband and she denied the husband his agreed upon time with the children for Halloween of 2012. The wife has consistently failed to honor other time sharing agreed upon in the party's emails. She has backed out of agreed upon counseling, even when such counseling was intended only to facilitate communication between the parties. Unfortunately, the broken promises, communication withdrawal, and deceitful behavior indicate that the wife really cannot be trusted to consider the children's best interests or the husband's reasonable parenting interests in contrast to hers, in any manner that approximates fairness. As explained above, the wife's employment is not going to be considerably better if she relocates. Her job offer from the law firm in South Florida would require the wife to work substantially more hours for virtually the same amount of income as she currently receives without any job security Moreover, she does not even allege that she had trouble making ends meet or that she made e efforts to find a higher paying job in Tallahassee. Moreover, any travel that the husband does is completely optional at this point and occurs when the wife has the children pursuant to their 50-50 time sharing arrangement. 
The wife's petition also omits that she travels extensively and was away herself from the children for almost five weeks during the spring of 2012 alone. Finally, in his prayer for relief, Dan asked the court to dismiss the petition to relocate and said, Indeed, the wife who unilaterally helped herself to $400,000 of assets she only barely contributed to should be forced to bear the full legal costs of this frivolous petition, which emerged during a period in which the wife lulled the husband into believing that they could resolve most of their issues amicably and with little outside intervention. He requested 50-50 time sharing and asked that he be given sole decision-making authority over education, medical, and religious matters. Lastly, he says, if Wendy moves to South Florida to take the job, the kids should stay in Tallahassee and she can come up to visit them every other weekend on her own dime. She can have them in South Florida for spring break, July 4th, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Well, Wendy didn't get her hearing before May 1st. There were multiple hearings noticed on the docket, but for some reason, they were all canceled. In the next several months, Dan filed a memorandum of law supporting his motion. It basically set out the legal standard in Florida for relocation of minor children and included a lot of case law to support his position that Wendy's request should not be granted. So how did Wendy respond to Dan's assertions? In June of that year, so six months after making her original request, Wendy filed her own memorandum of law and a memorandum of facts in support of her petition. Now, there was nothing extraordinary about these filings. They simply repeated much of what was already stated in the initial petition for relocation, and they failed to address most of the points raised by Dan in his objections. For example, Dan addressed Wendy's claim that he desired and intended on moving out of Tallahassee for a new job at some point. Dan had rebutted by saying, yeah, it was true that I wanted to leave Tallahassee for a better opportunity, but that was before I received my tenureship with FSU. Now with this coveted position, I have no reason and there's no reason for me to leave Tallahassee and I have no intention of moving. Wendy's memorandum of law simply ignored the current information that Dan provided and reiterated that during the marriage, he said he wanted to move elsewhere should a better career opportunity present itself. Wendy went on to explain that she was offered a job in South Florida that offered more money and better career advancement than her current job in Tallahassee. Not acknowledged were Dan's arguments that accepting the job would mean less flexibility to meet the kids' needs, more working hours, a longer commute. None of that was addressed. In terms of legal arguments, Wendy distinguished the cases that Dan cited to support his position. She argued those cases were different than their case because those cases all had established visitation or parenting schedules. Wendy and Dan didn't yet have a parenting plan in place yet. She then argued for a time-sharing arrangement that favored her, as opposed to Dan, who had argued for a 50-50 time-sharing split. Wendy again mentioned that Dan traveled a great deal and was never the primary caretaker for the kids. For those reasons, she believed it was in the best interest of the kids to have majority time spent with her. Dan took another bite at the apple and responded to Wendy's memorandum. He raised two main issues. First, he argued that Wendy never pled the required facts to support an order of relocation. He pointed out that Florida law required there to be allegations of an economic necessity and a lack of two parents who are substantially involved and equally capable and loving. Dan next went into detail about the cases Wendy cited in support of her petition. For each case, Dan set forth how the facts in that case was, were unlike the facts in their case. So for example, in one of those cases where relocation was allowed, the wife was from another country and she didn't have a work visa 
to gain employment in the U.S. So the court allowed her relocation to go back to her home country due to economic necessity. In another case, the husband worked two jobs and was unwilling or unable to adequately care for the children in his very little free time. Long story short, Dan showed how the facts in the cases where relocation was permitted were very different from the facts in their case, since in their case, there was no economic reason that made relocation a necessity, and because Dan was a ready, willing, and available parent to the boys. His second main argument was that Wendy's petition for relocation failed to plead facts with specificity like Florida law requires. Dan pointed out several bare and unsupported allegations that Wendy made that he argued weren't specific enough to prepare a defense. Under Florida laws, the rules of civil procedure require fact pleading. So they have to allege enough ultimate facts to show that they're entitled to relief. Dan provided several examples of where Wendy's allegations fell short of the pleading standard. Here are a couple. On page two of her memorandum, wife submits that she has been the primary parent of the boys up until the date of filing the petition for dissolution. She bolsters this putatively by refer reference to the fact that husband has traveled for work. But she doesn't identify how much she has traveled for work, how much she has traveled for work or for fun, and that has been extensive, as will be shown at the hearing, or what standards she thinks are relevant to determining who is a primary parent. On page three, she describes her position as tenuous and that husband has made it difficult for the wife with her colleagues due to his statements and actions. But she does not identify any way in which her position is tenuous other than the fact that she is not a tenured professor. One can be a stable, flexible, and wonderful position without enjoying academic tenure. The other persons who have the same position as her have been there since 1991, 1995, 1995, and 2001. There doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be anything tenuous about being a clinical professor at a public university. In short, she has a contract with a public university which can only fire for just cause under the relevant collective bargaining agreements. By contrast, there is no evidence of even a contract with the private law firm, just a two-line email confirmation of an offer of employment as an at-will employee with no mention of benefits, flexibility, or stability. Moreover, any claims of difficulty in the workplace are utterly belied by the fact that after the separation, the faculty unanimously decided to make wife's legal clinic permanent, and her being hired to direct that clinic was the unanimous decision of the ad hoc committee that conducted a national search. In short, wife asserts that her position at FSU is tenuous, but doesn't explain why an at-will employee relationship with a private law firm would be less tenuous than a state employee position with a university and a collective bargaining agreement. Six, the wife states on page, on page five to six that husband has no intention of staying in Tallahassee, but she doesn't say when he said that, to whom, and with what qualifications, if any. She references jobs or cities he has considered, but she does not mention that all of those were prior to having children, let alone prior to the separation. Dan wasn't quite finished yet. His last section pointed out false statements made in Wendy's petitions. Those included that the couple never lived married in Washington, D.C., that her entire family does not live in South Florida, she has a brother in New York, and that she filed the petition not in August, but in September. Here is Dan's conclusion. The wife's pleadings are vague, filled with rank and obvious falsehoods, and the legal analysis is fundamentally inept. Even if all the facts in the wife's petition were taken as true, there is no allegation of economic necessity or parents who are unwilling or unable to be involved in a deep and loving fashion. For the preceding reasons, the petition should be dismissed with prejudice and costs awarded to the husband. Indeed, if costs are not awarded, then wife and her affluent parents who are bankrolling wife's litigation so that they can in, so that they can enjoy closer access to the grandchildren 
or will persist in vexatious and groundless litigation and thereby prevent the parent from reaching a space where they can cooperate, collaborate, and communicate effectively and warmly in the project of raising their wonderful children. I just want to share with you quickly a timeline of these motions to emphasize the intensity to which Dan took this matter. If you look here, Wendy filed her memorandum of law on June 13th at 1154 AM. It was five months, five months after she filed her original request to relocate. 26 hours later on June 14th, just after 2 PM the next day, Dan filed his reply to Wendy's memorandum of law, a substantive document discussing the legal framework, standards of law, reviewing and distinguishing multiple cases raised by Wendy, analyzing the operative statute, making new arguments and reiterating existing arguments to support his position is a feat that would objectively take several days at a very minimum to write. Now, I acknowledge I'm a slow legal brief writer, but for Dan and or his counsel to churn out a reply document of this caliber out in 26 hours is it's just inhuman to me. A week after Dan filed his reply, the court signed an order denying Wendy's petition to relocate. In a two-page order, the court simply stated that it did not find that wife has met her burden of proof. It went on to order the parties to conduct mediation and then set out a temporary parenting schedule through August of that year. It ordered the parties to have daily phone calls and Skype sessions with the non-custodial parent. Lastly, it included permission for Dan to take the kids to Canada from August 8th to the 21st and mandated Wendy to send to sign all necessary paperwork that might be required for that trip. So the order denied the request to relocate and it was done with prejudice, which means that the issue cannot could not be litigated any further. If something is done with prejudice, it's basically barred from any further action. So. That was just a nail in the coffin of any hope that Wendy had to escape Tallahassee with her sons. It quite literally made her stuck in Tallahassee, as we heard her explain in her Truman Scholarship interview. If you haven't watched my video on that, I'll leave a link to it below. Reading through the relocation filings really made it evident to me the, the hatred or perhaps the hurt Dan and Wendy had for each other. I tried putting myself in Wendy's shoes and in Donna Sue's shoes, reading through Dan's responses, and I can understand how their blood probably boiled reading his words. He didn't hold back in describing Wendy's actions or her motivation or the motivations of her family. And frankly, while I wholeheartedly condemn the actions that were later taken, I can understand how they, with their selfish motivations, probably felt cornered by Dan and at a loss for options that prioritize them and their needs. It's absolutely disgusting, but I can see how this relocation denial probably started, started their gears thinking like, what can we do about this situation? Dan Rashbaum made this connection too, and he confirmed it with Wendy on the stand. When you lost the relocation motion, I think it's fair to say that your mom and dad were pretty upset. That's right. Uh, it's fair to say that your mom came up with some crazy ideas. Totally bonkers. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, the divorce proceedings were only going to get worse, more combative, more accusatory, more threatening, more venomous. If you'd like to see more from the divorce files, or if you want a video of me reading the entire relocation documents out and not just summarizing them like in this video, let me know in the comments below and um, I can look into doing that. We can also do some more deep dives. Please take a moment to like this video and don't forget to subscribe so you can follow along as I bring you more videos like this. As always, thanks for being here with me until the next drop. Peace.